Well, this morning we are going to continue uh, in our, our series that we've actually been doing for the last couple of weeks. The last two weeks, we spent a little bit of time looking at the life of Martin Luther, the, the famous German reformer who really transformed the world, not only in his day and age, but history in many ways. Looks back to the pivotal moments of the life of Martin Luther. And as I have said over the last two weeks, we sit here today as heirs of the Reformation work. Many of us in this room are those who have heard and understood the truth gospel message that we are saved by Christ alone. It is by his grace at work in us through faith alone that brings us into the saving knowledge of who God is and his work in us to sanctify us and transform us and change us. That's all because of the clarity we have in the word of God. And, and you and I are called to not only be heirs receiving the benefits of the Reformation, but those who carry on the light of the Reformation. And so we must stand firm for these truths today as well. Well, this morning, what I want us to do is to <clears throat> take a little bit more look at Luther's story. We've spent two weeks kind of really just at certain key moments of his story, and we're going to look at his story past 1517, the posting of the 95 Theses on the Castle Church door in Wittenberg, Germany, we talked about last week, and, and even past 1518, where we talked about his uh, document, the Heidelberg Disputation, and some of the things that came out of that, as we, again, talked about last week. We're going to move forward to the next couple years of Luther's life, but I do want to end with the very... Uh, one of the statements, a very powerful statement that was given in the 28th thesis of this Heidelberg Disputation in 1518 that was stated by Luther when he said, the love of God does not find but creates that which is pleasing to it. It's an interesting statement for, for Luther to make, and it helps us, I think, explain Luther to us in some really important ways. See, Luther was, as I said last week, not a perfect man by any means. He was, he was rough. He was earthy. Uh, that's why the common folk related so well to him. He was very intelligent, no doubt, but he was prone to being a little brash, a little coarse in his language at times, had a fiery temper, and felt emotions very deeply, as his life will testify. If you look at his biography, he would often swing from fiery anger to times of despair and depression. He felt deeply this human experience. Looking back historically, uh, many scholars would agree and admit of all the reformers that kind of came before Luther and those who came after Luther, he wasn't the only reformer that we have had in church history, but of all that kind of came, Luther really in some ways is the most unlikely candidate of, of all. There were others who seemed more naturally suited, better fit for this calling of being the chief catalyst of the Reformation that God chose to use Luther for. But at the end of the day, it was Luther that was used. And I think this truth, as Luther even articulates it here, it helps us see this biblical reality well. God is not a God who is looking around to find those who are already put together already lovable, already naturally well-suited and gifted, already perfect for the service to him that he desires to, comp to accomplish. No, rather, God is the God who creates in a person whom he chooses to set his love on, an unlovable sinner. He loves that person, calls that person, changes that person, and makes them into the instrument he intends to use. What great news for all of us that is. For we're all sinners, we are all undeserving, we are all unqualified, we are all ill-equipped to do this great mission that God has put before us, and yet it is God who sets his love upon us, who chooses us, who changes us, who equips us, and then who uses us to accomplish his great plans. Think of the amazing words of scripture that teach us this truth, the words that Luther knew and summarized with that statement in the 28th thesis, John 15, 16, Jesus says, for you did not choose me, but I chose you. And notice, I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Or the most succinct statement, the powerful words in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, we love because he first loved us. See, Luther was not just naturally the great reformer destined to change the world. Luther was a regular man, but he was a man that was chosen by God, loved by God, and then changed by God over a, a, quite a period, really, of time and deep study of the word of God. And he was used as a tool in the hand of the God whose purposes never fail and whose work are always good 
and righteous. So over the course of years, Luther grew to develop, as we've talked about in the last two weeks. And we're going to look at a few years' worth of Luther's life, the pace of life was a lot different before the technology that we have today, where you can call, text, tweet, <laughs> anyone, anytime. Things took a little longer to, to come to pass in history. And so we're going to look at events that took place briefly in the year 1519, a whole year, and then 1520, and finally into 1521. Over the course of 1519 and 1520, things continued to develop in Luther as he was reading the Word of God, beginning to really think critically about the things that he was experiencing around him, And it came clear to Luther and to others who were being impacted by his teaching, the need for Reformation was deep. It it went well beyond just the 95 theses on the issue of indulgence. It was much bigger than that. And Luther began to see that more clearly as time went on. So in 1519, Luther engages in in a rather important debate in the town of Leipzig. In this debate, Luther publicly and boldly began to insist that Jesus Christ is the only true head of the church, not the pope. He also claimed that Scripture alone holds ultimate authority, not the Pope, not church councils. These were big claims in his day. By 1520, Luther had continued to develop his thoughts and produced three masterful works that were published. The first is the Address to the Christian Nobility of the German Nation. The second was titled The Babylonian Captivity of the Church. And the third is The Freedom of the Christian Nation. Man. These were very important works that solidified, in many ways, the conflict between the Roman Catholic Church and Martin Luther and those who were understanding Martin Luther's teachings and following him in that, in these cries for reformation. Well, the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, did not like what Luther was teaching. The conflict had started with those 95 theses and then developed through the Heidelberg Disputation, through Augsburg, through Leipzig, and through these published books. Things were getting more and more clear conflict was abounding. So the papacy responds to Martin Luther with an official edict, what is called a papal bull, referring to the bull in the Latin, refers to the seal that was placed on an important document. And the name of the papal bull in, is titled by the first few words of it in English. It would be Arise, O Lord, but in Latin it's Exerge Domine. This was the papal bull which was issued by the Pope that called Luther to recant. Renounce everything you have said. Claim publicly that you will turn from it. You will no longer teach it. Denounce it. And if you do not, you will be excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church. October 10th, 1520, Luther's personally handed a copy of the document there in Wittenberg. He reads the document and reads the Pope's decree. In 60 days, you must recant of your teaching or you will be condemned as a heretic and an outlaw. Exactly 60 days from the day he receives it, on December 10th, 1520, Luther walks right outside the the, uh, wall of the castle, out the gate to a crowd of hundreds of people, students, professors, interested people from the community, And stands before a fire on this cold December afternoon. And he cites Psalm 21.10. Luther says, Because you, referring to the Pope, have confounded the truth of God, today the Lord confounds you into the fire with you. And with that, Luther throws the papal bull into the flames and burns the Pope's declaration. Well, Rome followed through on their threat. They gave him 60 days to recant. Luther did not recant. He burned the document in front of hundreds of witnesses. And so a new papal bull was issued on January 3rd, 1521, declaring Martin Luther is now a heretic and an outlaw, according to the Roman Catholic Church. On March 26th, 1521, Martin Luther receives another document placed into his hand. This one not from the Pope, but also bearing an important seal on it. It was a letter from the new Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. The document was a summons to come to an imperial meeting called a Diet held in the German city of Worms. He was to stand before the emperor himself and answer questions about his teaching and these charges that were leveled against him by Rome, the charge of being a heretic specifically, and a charge that if it was sustained would mean Luther's public execution. It is the Diet of Worms, not the Diet of Worms. (laughs) I had a, kind of an aside here, when I uh, was at my previous church in Springfield. I had a, a, a man and his wife who were German, 
They were born in Germany, had, had uh, immigrated to the U.S. And when I would teach on Luther, he would always come up to me and thank me for my proper pronunciation of these towns. He says, it's just awful when people think of us having these German things in the past and they think of a diet of worms, like we're eating those little crawly things. He said, no, no, it's a, it's a die, which comes from Latin, but it's worms, worms, it's a V sound with the W. So he was always grateful for that proper pronunciation and hopefully will not confuse you when you see this written. Luther is summoned to the Diet. He's going to stand before the emperor. He's going to be made to give an account for these charges leveled against him. And it's at this point, after the summons, Luther writes a private letter to a friend and explains to him that he will indeed go. He will explain his teaching before the emperor and all who would listen to him. But he knew very well that this could be a trap and would likely be a death sentence for him. So with full knowledge of what it could cost him, Luther wrote these words, which will take us to the text of Scripture in Daniel 3 that we're going to consider today. Luther wrote to his friend, For he who saved the three men in the furnace of the Babylon king still lives and rules. If he does not want to preserve me, then my head is of no importance compared with Christ. But we must take care that we do not expose the gospel to the derision of the godless because we are afraid to shed our blood for it. May the merciful Christ prevent such cowardice on our part. Amen. As I said two weeks ago, Luther was a man who was made by God's grace at work in his life to become unashamedly bold. When he understood the gospel message from Romans chapter 1, 16 and 17, that it is by faith alone, God's grace alone at work in us, not a result of what we do or our own worthiness. When he understood it's all of God's grace and our response is to be simply faith and trust, obedience to him, then Luther moved from the, the darkness that he was held captive into the light of true Christianity. And when Luther did that, he became prepared to proclaim, to suffer, even to die for the sake of the truth of the gospel. In fact, he became convinced that to be willing to do anything less would be cowardice and sinfulness. Luther understood he had been chosen, he had been loved, he had been called by God to be a servant of God, used however God wanted to use him. And Luther would not sin against his Lord by refusing to play his part. So Luther looked to the text of Scripture to draw encouragement, to speak to the day that he was in, as we should do today. And it's this text in Daniel 3 that I think as we consider it today will also speak to us words that would embolden us and encourage us as it did Luther as he headed to the Diet of Worms. We'll pick up the story in Daniel chapter 3, verse 8. Daniel chapter 3, verse 8. A story you're probably familiar with. Now, therefore, at a certain time, Certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden idol. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, we're we're kind of jumping into the, the conflict here a little bit, right? But you probably know the story. It's often taught in Sunday school lessons and children's Bibles. If you grew up in in church or a Christian home, right, you know that Veggie Tales did an episode on this very story, but replaced a few key details, right? It wasn't the golden image. It was the what? Oh, no VeggieTales fans. So disappointed. The giant chocolate bunny? The bunny song? Wow. Okay. (laughs) We're going to have to have family movie night and together learn about the giant chocolate bunny. Nebuchadnezzar was a real king. As, as much as fun as VeggieTales can be, right, we can sometimes think, well, these stories are pretty incredible and amazing. And of course, when you build a 90-foot chocolate bunny that you want everybody to bow down to, you, you might think, well, these aren't really the real things. But in the Bible, the stories we're reading are real historical events. Nebuchadnezzar was a real king over the nation of Babylon. He was a brutal dictator and a warrior king. When Nebuchadnezzar and his armies conquered Jerusalem, they took 
many people captive into slavery and service, including, it's the beginning of Daniel, tells us the history of this. They took a man named Daniel and three other young men who we now know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and put them in his palace. And, and it was to them, they were to be trained and serve the king there in Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar was like most of the pagans of his day. He believed there were multiple gods. So the Israelites who he had conquered, they believed in their God. And he said, fine, you know, you can have your God, but you need to worship my gods as well. And kind of, they just put them all together in one big pot. And they were fine if you wanted to worship your God and these people wanted to worship their God, as long as you didn't claim your God was the only God or better than someone else's God. Those were issues they wouldn't tolerate. But Nebuchadnezzar had no problem for them to incorporate their own God as long as they would worship him and his own God. See, Nebuchadnezzar, like so many other rulers who gained such power to themselves, he he began to think that he himself deserved worship. And he certainly, as the great king of Babylon, deserved full obedience. His command should be obeyed without question. And he was powerful and very successful. The golden image that Nebuchadnezzar made was certainly impressive. If you read back up in the first few bits of of Daniel there before this, you learn this golden image was about 90 feet tall and nine feet wide, covered in gold. I mean, it was impressive, a massive symbol of the might of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, his wealth and his power to make such a thing. And Nebuchadnezzar, after having it made, wasn't content to just say, ah, it's a nice piece of art, you know, I'll kind of put it over here in my palace, I'll enjoy it. He wanted everyone to bow to it. And when the music played, everyone was to pay homage to the image. It was a moment of, much like it would be to pledge loyalty to a nation, by bowing down to this image that Nebuchadnezzar had erected, you were swearing obedience and service to Nebuchadnezzar. And so if you refused to do that, the punishment, as he made clear in the decrees, would be the same punishment one would suffer for treason, immediate execution for disobeying the command. So the conflict is raised here because these jealous Chaldeans hate Daniel and they hate his friends because they are Israelites and because they obey the one true God. And he had been blessing them, as you read in the first three chapters of Daniel. So they hate them. They're looking for any reason they can to destroy them to remove them from their positions. And we read in Daniel 3, verse 13, what happens. After being told this, Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Now, Nebuchadnezzar was certainly powerful. He was not used to being disobeyed. In fact, people who disobeyed him usually ended up dying, very painful deaths. Nebuchadnezzar acted as if he was a god to his people. He controlled their lives. He demanded full obedience from them, and he would end the life of anyone he so chose. And these three men are being brought before him. They are, remember, slaves of a nation that Nebuchadnezzar has conquered. They were taken from their homes, brought to his palace to have their entire lives be one of service to him. And now he's being told they would defy his royal will? Of course, it made him furious. And Nebuchadnezzar was actually so arrogant that he said the out loud part <laughs> that was probably supposed to meant to be more inside, right? I think many evil rulers, evil people who gain power think thoughts like this, but stop short of saying it. But Nebuchadnezzar simply says out loud, who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? I know you worship your God, but no, in this moment, this place, I control everything. He believed his power was ultimate. Now, jumping back just to Luther for a moment, Luther knew this text very well. He had preached and taught through Daniel. He understood how dangerous of a task it was for these Israelites to stand before a king like Nebuchadnezzar. He knew the evil of this ruler historically. And Luther found an interesting parallel to his own day and age, didn't he? He, too, was being called to stand before the most powerful ruler in all of the world in just a few short days. Luther knew he was going before a man who could and did have people who defied his orders put to death, just as Nebuchadnezzar did. The powers that Luther was standing against were real and powerful. Charles V and Leo X were powerful people. They were real, and they were very dangerous to Luther. 
And yet the arrogant question that Nebuchadnezzar asked in the text was what Luther had in mind as he thought through who is the God who could deliver them, who is the God who could deliver me. And so the very next words were words of beautiful encouragement to Luther. Look at verses 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. (laughs) But even if not, be it known to you, O king, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. For so many Christians all throughout history, all around the world, this reply has been one of great encouragement and guidance to us. The boldness of a person who truly believes that the God he serves is true and all-powerful and is to be obeyed, that his word, his command is above all else, is an amazingly transformative belief. This response that's given here to the face of someone who really could take your life is not false bravado. This isn't like just, I'm going to post on social media or talk a big game with my friends. The, The stand that many people will take today has no personal cost. And it's based on personal feelings or preferences. But these men, no, they were courageous for the truth. They were convictional. So they would say face to face to this person with a learned Godly conviction, knowing the command of God. We know what our God has said, and we will not sin against him by disobeying his word. They said, in effect, we believe our God is far more powerful than you are. We believe he can and he will deliver us from you. But even if he doesn't decide to do that, we will not sin against him. These three Israelite men knew their God and who he was in a way that was deeply and really impactful to their lives. They weren't playing at following God. They didn't think that their religion was just a nice add-on to, to their lives. They weren't content with comfort. They weren't willing to compromise on holiness. Obedience to God was not something they would give up in order to make lives easier for themselves. Their actions and words have inspired so many down throughout the ages, still inspires many today. I've drawn a lot of confidence personally, assurance from this text myself in the last several months. Because I understand this key truth, what these men understood, what Luther understood in his day and so many others. True faith means being willing to put everything on the line and refuse to compromise and embrace sin for the sake of self-preservation. I mean, really, I think all these guys had to do was bow down to the image like everybody else. Everybody else was doing it. They just needed to not draw any attention to themselves. Don't rock the boat any. And they would have been accepted. Everything would have been fine. But they knew that not calling out sin was itself sinful. They knew their God was holy. They knew his words of command must be obeyed. They knew that sin is spiritually deadly. And it's far better to take a risk physically than to have your soul be taken captive and destroyed by sinfulness and disobedience to the word of God. And so they stood face to face and spoke boldly to Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar responds, much as we would assume he would. Verse 19, Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. And because the king's order was urgent and the furnace was overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. The fury of Nebuchadnezzar really was terrifying. Often, again, we we can move so fast in as we read the Bible, especially stories that we're familiar with, that we can fail to really feel a text the way we should. The wrath of Nebuchadnezzar here is terrifying. Think of the the angriest person you've ever encountered. It's that on steroids, right? I mean, it's worse than that because whoever was angry at you didn't throw you into a burning, fiery furnace. (laughs) This is another level, right? 
It's so strong that he orders the furnace. I want the temperature maxed out. Throw all the fuel in there. Crank it up. If this is a furnace, and it likely was, used to to melt metals, perhaps even the gold that he had used to form the, the giant image, it's far hotter than is necessary to cremate a human body. This is the type of temperature that he has made here. So high that we read, even in the text, his own soldiers who were to take them up to the top and throw them into the top of the furnace, they died as they were doing that, either because the heat radiated so hot or the flame would have, you know, the wind shifted and the flame came out and consumed them. Either way, this is how hot the temperature is to kill the guards charged with pushing the men into the furnace. This type of deranged, destructive evil really is hard for all of us who have lived in such privileged, safe lives to really grasp, but I think intellectually we can understand it in part when we slow down and we really consider what's being said here. But the point is not how awful Nebuchadnezzar really was, and it's not really to answer the question of what was the temperature of the furnace. The most amazing part is what we read next. Look at verse 24. And then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. And rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said, True, O king. He answered and said, But I I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Again, just in terms of the temperature of of the, the furnace, these men should have died instantly. Their bodies could have been cremated in that level of heat. But astonishingly, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't just see their form as it falls to the bottom of the furnace. He's amazed that he sees them standing completely intact, walking around in the midst of the fire. And not only the three that he threw in, but a fourth among them. So Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw the fire had not any power over the bodies of these men. The hair on their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. When the three Israelite men walk out of that fire, in and of itself, an incredible act of God, they're completely unharmed, with not even the smell of smoke about them. No clothing or hair singed on them. Everyone there saw indisputable proof the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is greater than all other powers. Clearly, then, this God was rightly to be obeyed above all other authorities, including this king, Nebuchadnezzar. The faith and obedience of these three men to stand firm, to refuse to sin by disobeying God and his word really is inspiring, right? This text should make us feel emboldened as we hear it, more encouraged. I want to be like them, right? But really, the deepest inspiration of this text doesn't come from their boldness or their words or their actions. The boldness that we should gain from this text comes not from looking so much to them as it is to the fourth who was seen in the fire. That's what Luther saw and recounted to his friend in that letter, right? The opening line, for he who saved the three men in the furnace of the Babylon king still lives and rules. Not if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could be bold enough to defy a king, so can I. No, no. He who delivered them, he still lives and rules. The most important figure in that account of Daniel 3, it's not Shadrach, it's not Meshach, it's not Abednego or Nebuchadnezzar. It's the fourth in the fire. It's God himself, Jesus, who still lives and still rules. And so returning to Luther's story in 1521, he knew that was his God. And he went, just as he said he would, to the Diet of Worms, He stood before the most powerful man on earth at that time. And on April 18th and 1521, Luther, standing before the emperor, was asked again, will you recant completely of all your teachings and all your works? And he gave this famous reply. Since then, your serene majesties and lordships seek a simple answer. I will give it in this manner, plain and unvarnished. Unless I am convinced... 
by the testimony of the scripture or clear reason. For I do not trust in the Pope or in the councils alone, since it is well known they often err and contradict themselves. I am bound to the scriptures I have quoted. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. God help me. Amen. <laughs> and this is in the all scopes of history. These great speeches we have, this is a bold one. I, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't move you quite the way it moves me when I hear it. I mean, there's, there's nothing better. There's a podcast to buy and I have been listening to about the, the life of Luther. And there's an actor who plays Luther and has his German accent. When he reads this speech, it's, ah, you know, it's goosebumps. And I'm like, woo, yeah, you know, I get excited. Because Luther's boldness here came from the same God who I serve. Amen. Came from the same understanding of who God is and what God can do that I have. And if Luther can do this, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego can do this, we can do this. This is the result of a real God who works in his people. He was convinced this is the power, this is the authority of the God whom he served. Luther did believe that God could he believed God would save him from the emperor. But Luther was resolved that even if God chose not to do it, Luther would not sin against God by disobeying him, renouncing his word, and failing to give everything for the sake of the truth. Luther could not compromise in sin and simply pursue a false peace and allow God's gospel and his commands to be ignored. He was emboldened to stand firm for his God and his word. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Luther was willing to give his life in order to stay faithful and obedient to God. He would not be a coward who chose to ignore the word of God and violate the clear commands and teachings of Scripture. He would not recant from the truth. He would give up everything. He would even die rather than sin against his God in this way. He was bold, not just because those other men had been bold, but as we said, because... The fourth was in the fire with them. And Luther believed God was with him too. He trusted that God can deliver. He trusted that God would deliver. But he knew that even if he did not, Christians, all Christians, must stand firm on the truth that God alone is to be worshipped, trusted, and obeyed no matter what. And this is how you and I should live. Moving from from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to Luther, to us today, understand clearly this is how we should live. This is how we should respond when we think of God's delivering power in Daniel chapter 3. It's far more than just a Bible story that we'll read through as we're going through our Bible reading plan or as we're doing a Sunday school lesson. This is a powerful motivator for godly, faithful living for those of us who apply the truths that are in it. So today, in, in response to, to God's word, to his promises, and then his testimony of faithfulness and kindness to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to Luther, as we have looked at his story a bit, we have the opportunity to respond in faith and trust too, to draw inspiration ourselves from the actions of those who have gone before us, but more importantly, from the one who was with them and is still with us. If you are not obeying God and his word, or if you're not a true Christian, today is the day to respond to him, to find and experience his love for us, his changing power, that salvation that is at work in his people personally. Today's the day to repent, to put to death sin and come alive in the presence of the one who walks with his people through every fire, every danger, every hardship. Today, the calls actually genuinely really place our faith and trust both intellectually and experientially, in the one who died to redeem his people from their sins. Jesus suffered for us. You think, I, but, but can he understand my suffering, my hardship? He went to the cross, not just up to the point of death. He crossed to the point of death for his people. He knows. He is with you to the very end. He is the God who has died to redeem his people, who lives to save and change his people today. 
You and I can obey his commands. We can be faithful witnesses to his grace and glory when he empowers us and enables us to do so. And the way we get that power is by humbly, openly, genuinely coming before him and laying down our hold, our grip on our sins and trusting, having real faith in him. So this morning we're going to play some music through the system the way we did a a few weeks ago and we're just going to leave space and time for response and prayer as much as is needed today. Luther was quite correct in the first of the 95 theses that we looked at last week. The Lord intends for all of the Christian life to be one of repentance. So today, that's the call to each of us, that we would examine our own hearts, that we would repent of our sins, place our faith and our trust fully in God and ask him for the grace to be bold and unashamed, to be obedient and humble, to be people who love the light and do not cower in darkness, to seek forgiveness and sanctification rather than remaining captive to the deadliness of our personal sins. Today, when the Lord's work is done in your own heart personally, you're free to go. You can head out the back doors and be dismissed. But we'll play music and we'll pray in this place as long as we need this morning. Jason, if you'll begin the music, let's respond to the Lord. This first song is one Morgan and Tyler shared with me a while back. Actually, we we had played it at the funeral of, of Blakely. And it talks about another in the fire and how God is with us. No matter what we go through, he's present. We can trust him. We can lean on him. So would you join me in responding to him today?